Recording is on. There we go. All right, we are recording. This is the uh, April 2024 community chat. Um, and uh, our kind of subject or topic today is the uh, is what I'm calling a workshop share thon. Now we'll see, you know, how many people are able to share things and chat about it. I really just kind of wanted to have an informal talk about like running workshops and uh, for could be students, could be, you know, faculty or staff or really whatever context, I suppose. Um, and if folks have, you know, specific things they want to bring and say, hey, I, I ran this recently or a couple of years ago or, or whatever, that's really cool. Um, or maybe just general um, discussion around it. But um, yeah, I don't know. This is just the kind of thing I I personally think about a lot and sort of, you know, what is the best way to demonstrate something in a workshop context, right? It's a, like a really common scenario of, hey, we've got a handful of people. I want to communicate something to them. Um, what is What are the things that you like to do? What are the things you like to avoid in planning these things? Um, successes, stuff like that. I really like learning from other people, um, but usually in the context of workshops, for me anyway, that's just attending them and seeing what other people do, which is great. I wanted to see if I could convince people to uh, share their secrets, um, things like that. So um, yeah. Um, that uh, Shannon just put it in the chat, avoid workshops entirely when it should be a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Yes. <laughs> I, I feel like for me, that's my main thing is figuring out what is a workshop and what shouldn't be one. Um, that's a big one. And I also just to kick things off my main, um, and like I said, we can talk about this generally, if folks have a, something that they specifically said, hey, I ran this recently and want to walk us through it. That's awesome. Love to see that. Um, we have some examples too we can share. Um, but uh, one of my biggest things is figuring out what what should be a workshop and what should be like a set of documentation that I send to someone or a class. Right, that was my biggest thing when I worked um, in in higher ed specifically with with class settings. Is 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 deciding when when folks would say, "I'd love if you could come in and do this," and saying. I will get them the information they need to do this and I will come in, but we're, we are going to do this and we're going to not do this all together because some activities all together are not great to do <laughs> in my opinion. Some things are built to be done asynchronously. Yeah. It just, I'm not personally, I, I know lots of people do this and there are good and better ways to do it than what I've tried. Personally, I don't like let's all do this technical set of steps together type workshops because I, as a participant in them, frequently find them frustrating because I'm either ahead or behind. Like that, I'm always in one of the two. I feel like there's that's maybe it's not an inevitability, but it, it, it seems like it to me. So I don't like that because it feels like, well, you know, I'd rather have this person to talk to as a resource and ask questions of and talk strategy, then let's all type these letters in together kind of stuff, you know? I, I'm going to steal someone else's thunder. Just, I kind of do that a lot. So I'm not, I'm not afraid to do that. I remember there was a workshop that Martha Burtis run as part of the DKC where essentially what we wanted to do is have students make gifts. And so she made almost one of these very interesting like spot like websites where the student was like, pick an image that you want to turn into a gift and then go through the process. I think it's called give it up for the gift or something like that. Um, Okay, and the website's still live, so I might be able to give you a demonstration. But, like, she talked about what gifts are and how if they can be used in different ways. So it was informative for, like, 10 minutes. But the rest of the time, the last 20 to 30 minutes was go to this website in this lab and create a gift. And we have created the kind of structures by which you can do that. Um, yeah, give it up for the gift. There's a link to it in there. And um, 
it's a really I thought it was a really great workshop because at the end of the the workshop, everyone's GIF came up on the screen. You got to see what they made, and they were usually funny, and they told you something about the person, and it connected everybody. And she accomplished beautifully what she was setting out to do, which was show people, A, what gifts are, why they might matter, and take a shot at building them. I loved it. It was definitely an early splot, to your point, Tom. Definitely. It was super cool. Splots and workshops really would be a nice, nice combo. Well, and it's a nice combination of asynchronous and synchronous, right? Even if sometimes you have folks literally using the tool during the workshop, but it's not, you know, people can you give them a window of time or something like that, or it doesn't matter particularly when they did it, um, is always a interesting way to kind of mix digital and, uh, well, I wouldn't, I wasn't say digital in person, but it wouldn't have to be really synchronous and asynchronous. I mean, we're kind of hitting on like, what's the real purpose behind the thing? In that case, it was like, make the GIFs or whatever and talk about them together. So if you can cut out a lot of the directions and get to that and have that be your workshop, bam, take advantage of in-person, you know, what I consider really expensive time, which is anytime you're physically in a place together synchronously. Like I consider that like gold, high dollar, high dollar time. Whereas the asynchronous stuff or the stuff of this documentation is pretty cheap because, you know, you don't care. You do it once. It lives there for forever. That's, so I kind of think about spending my time uh, wisely. Uh, another chunk that at least always comes up to me is like faculty inevitably say, like, we want more workshops. And then they inevitably don't attend said workshops or register for said workshops and have a percentage rate that is very low. So really getting down to the guts of like, what are we, what are we doing here? Cause it takes a fair amount of effort to create workshops or even to hold the time for them. So just being intentional about that stuff, I'm trying to do a better job with, um, and showing like, like our new registration system is I think easier for us to show like who registered versus who actually attended and making that like part of our process so that we can go back. And maybe one other thing we're doing better there is we have like our workshops that we've done that we think people might ask for again and a way to allow them to ask for those workshops. Mm. So not so much doing better workshops, which I need, you know, all, always can improve on, but like the mechanics of it at the institutional level is something that I ramble around with a fair amount. I always kind of think of like, because the, the idea of, faculty or whoever asking for work more workshops or a specific workshop and then saying like well will people actually show up like i always view that as a like it's more of a almost a problem of partially terminology but mostly time of just like what people are asking for is i want to learn something new or something specific i have something in mind and i don't have a lot of time i don't i don't have 40 hours to commit to it I would love if I could show up and in 30 minutes to an hour or whatever, come out of that with something, right? And that's, I mean, I think that's a very understandable want. <laughs> like, I think almost anyone is like, yeah, like I also would like that. And so to me, it's always kind of trying to figure out like, well, what can I, what makes sense to deliver, like you said, given the expensive time that we're now, we, we've dedicated, we're here, we can do this. Um, what is the best use of that time? And I like to, I don't know that this is necessarily successful, but I always like to plant seeds using that time and say, you know, we're talking about this. This is some background information you need. Let's do this thing together in this workshop. Mm -hmm. And I really hope that what I'm showing you here sparks an interest in that you will decide to spend more time because it's important to you. And here's where you go. That's that's kind of always my format for these things. I mean, even with the stuff we do at Reclaim with Flex Courses, we do it similarly where it's like, we're trying to communicate like why this matters and why you may want to care early on <laughs> and then give you some you know specific information and insight when we can. Um, but to me, the hook is important, I think. 
Taylor, I think to, to follow up on that point, it, to me, the most successful parts of workshops are if I can connect a second time, like, because if I ask them at the end of the workshop to tell me something you learned, tell me something you think you might want to try at some point, and then a couple of weeks, a month go by, and I just pick it up and say, how's it going with that? Do you want to do more with it? Do you need some help? Like, it it usually doesn't happen in that first month or even the first second month. but around month four or five, like sometimes they'll come back around. And if they're not back around by then, I figure they're not coming back. <laughs> so, um, but, but again, it, it has to do with, you know, to Tom's point, like, do you have the time to do that? Do you have the, you know, like, what is the motivation to do that? And for me, it's really just getting, uh, building more of a coalition of the willing, right? Like if I can work with somebody one-on-one -on -one, and then I can get them to talk to somebody in their department, and then the department starts to hear more about it. And again, it's a long game, but it sometimes will work. Um, but not, I guess I would say, reliably enough to say like, wow, that's a real hit all the time, but a few times. And, and the other piece, I think, is whatever structures I can use that are within the university system already. I just try to use those things that put more of the work on other people and I just have to deliver a little something. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> so um, like um, we have our Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning and every year they do a symposium. So they have a guest speaker and then they ask for like short workshops or quick tech tips or whatever. And I always volunteer for something in that just again, to get like people to know who I am. And it's not a huge investment in my time to prepare it, but it's enough to get it to be like, you know, to get my my face out there and even better if I can bring a panel of people, like someone who I picked up last year and helped up with a project and like build it around their project so that it's less about me and what I do and more about what they did and their goals. And, you know, and I think that that, you know, it's a slow, slow process, at least for me, it has been, um, but it does lead to some success. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more in terms of like how, like, it sounds to me like you're saying, like, fundamentally, part of the what you're hoping to get is to sort of recruit people to the cause a little bit, right? And that could be whatever, you know, related to your workshop, right? But I love the idea of, yeah, the coalition of the willing there, like, because I mean, I, I, I fundamentally agree even in, you know, in schools of different sizes and it, like the best way to communicate an idea is that one-on-one -on -one stuff. And that comes from showing up, <laughs> you know, doing a workshop, having one person afterwards be like, that was really cool. We should talk more about that. And maybe that person follows. Yeah. I couldn't agree more with that sentiment. I have a funny story about something related to this. Like, so I was in Puerto Rico and it was 2009 and I had done a presentation terribly received. And um, basically the guy who had me there was like, I really want you to do a workshop on Twitter. I'm like, Twitter? Like they just hated everything I said. It's like, no, no, no. They've been asking. So I have like a stadium full, like 200 people like to talk about Twitter with. And people who had just been in a previous thing I did who hated it. And so I get on and I'm like, Twitter is kind of known for being a very like uninteresting technology in some ways. Like, what did you have for lunch, right? And what did you have for this? And so I showed them how to log in. We had networking problems, of course. It was one of those things. And then they got in and many of them, I'm like, you should, like one of those early times where I got all my followers was like, okay, you don't know who's on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. I'm Jim Groom. Follow me. So 200 people follow me. Good for the stats. But then I'm having this kind of like, that's it. Like that's Twitter, hashtags, at signs. But to your point, Jen, and why I even say this is some of those people who, again, it wasn't an inspired presentation, wasn't an inspired thing, I have followed for years and have kind of been in contact with ye for years around that presentation. Um, I would say of the many people who signed up, maybe 10 or 11 were constantly in 
a route of kind of communication and seeing what they were doing. And even if it was one-on-one, -on -one. but it's interesting, but like, what would be a way now to build in a form of, you know, tracking and not a creepy way, but tracking in a way of understanding and seeing, Oh, the work we did, how did it follow through? And, you know, did it make a point and, you know, can we reconnect around it? Because Twitter was the perfect tool for that, right? It was just a, a, a chance of history that I was asked to do that in a kind of, you know, impromptu way. But I realized once I'd done it and for years later that like doing Twitter workshops was probably one of the coolest ways to actually, you know, test how people got it and where they went with it, kind of like blogging, although that was a little harder because less people, it was a lot more work. Um, but it, interesting in that regard. Yeah, I think really that that follow up is what a lot of people need. And it doesn't have to be a huge follow up. It just has to be the like, put it back on your radar follow up. Because at least to me, when I go to conferences and stuff, I might see a lot of cool things or learn a few things. But if I'm not immediately putting them into what I'm doing on a daily basis, I'm just going to forget about them. You know, like even if I do write some notes or, you know, write a blog or something like it, it just doesn't until I can find how it's going to work immediately for me. I like 75% of it is just gone, <laughs> you know? So, and I think that's like educationally what we know, right? Like when people don't immediately use the things that they're trying to learn, then they don't practice them. They stop to, you know, they just, they can't come back. They can't bring it back. Right. You know? So uh, Tom, in answer to your question, I, I don't do anything complicated. I just ask them. And oftentimes it's actually just on a piece of paper, <laughs> like just to say like, hey, what's going on? You know, like, what do you want me to do? You want any follow up? You not want any follow up? Because that's the other piece. It's like, nobody wants to be spammed or feel like they want to avoid you around campus. <laughs> you know, So like, I always just say like, do you want me to follow up with you? And most of the time people will say maybe later, maybe like before next semester or something like that, if they kind of don't want me to follow up, but I still do it. Right. Like, and then if they come back to it, then they come back to it. And if not, then again, all I've really invested is a few minutes in the workshop and a few minutes in collecting those pieces of paper and throwing them into a spreadsheet, you know? Yeah. I really like the idea of like something I might take away from this conversation is that yeah, pretty much every workshop I deliver or something that resembles a workshop should have some kind of, you know, mechanism like you're describing. And that maybe it's in some cases self-driven where I can say like, you know, hey, thank you all. Click this button and I'll email you later. Or I just do that, you know, if I have everyone's email addresses or something like that. And literally just at a bare minimum say like, we will reach back out with the, you know, and you could even hook it into like, I'll share my resources back this way. Right. Um, but, but the mechanism of establishing a, at least chance for that communication again, does sound like it's one of those ideas that sounds like completely obvious. And I'm a little mad that I didn't think of, but like, yeah, like, cause you're right. If you don't revisit this, I, I do this all the time too. Like I take notes when I attend workshops and then I literally never look at them again. Um, and even if I was just reminded three months later that I should revisit those notes, I probably would in some cases. And yeah, that would make a huge difference. I think it also depends on your purposes, like, you know, what people are looking for. If you have a good enough understanding of why they're there, then you can tailor it more to like getting them started on something immediately, as opposed to having them try to walk away and figure out what are they going to do with it, you know? Yeah. So that's another piece that I try to do. If I can find out who the participants are a little bit ahead of time, even just a general sense, then it can help make a difference in the way that, you know, the, the things I might present. And I do that with students too. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, if I'm going into, and my workshops for students are really more the technical stuff, you know, like now click here, now do this, this is what this means, this is what that means. But I think that like, if you follow up even with a handful of them, right, you know, then starting to do that relationship building, especially for those students who I know I'm probably going to work with for the next few years, then I can, you know, kind of start getting some, some 
I don't know, just like relationship building really is what it is. Um, but again, it depends too on like, what's your purpose for the workshop? What's your, what are you hoping to get out of it? Mm -hmm. And the other thing I would just say is that like, one thing I really always hate about a workshop is the survey that comes afterwards. Like, I know it's important. Everybody needs to like, want that feedback. <laughs> But it always feels so generic. Like, you know, it's just sort of like, what you know, did you like the workshop? Blah, blah. Like, it just feels like it's always the same stuff. And it's never for me. It's always for whoever's running the workshop, right? Like, so that's another space where you could make it more about the participant. Mm -hmm. Like, what resources can I send you? Let you know. And again, small investment of your time. But it feels more like it is about them rather than what you can get from it. Yeah, I... Um... A uh, couple of things. I mean, this might just be an example of me being uh, obnoxious, not necessarily strategic, but I always, whenever the idea of a post uh, workshop survey comes up, I'm like, what are we doing with the information, right? Like, that's the first thing we have to figure out. If nothing, then then maybe we should not do a, a one. But but yeah, I like, how can we make a post workshop survey? useful for them and also us um is yeah couldn't agree more um but because because it's always like well we may want to look we may what do you mean we may like what, what does that mean like are we going to we should hopefully improve our practice and that that is obvious a thing but we need to ask specific questions in order to do that not just what did you like even though it does sound like we could based on that improve things you probably do need to get more specific but um I was kind of wondering, like, if you, Jen, or anybody else, too, has um, thoughts about, like, the um, the getting to know your audience, uh, your audience or whatever, the participants of your workshop beforehand. Because obviously, this is context dependent. I understand that. Like, sometimes you can just, you know, because you know the audience you're talking to. Um, I'm curious if anyone's had particular strategies they like to do for when you actually don't have a uh, uh, an opportunity to um the, the obvious opportunities to find this information out so say you're going to uh do a workshop at a conference and so there are participants maybe in a particular field or whatever but you don't really know a lot about them besides that has anyone done like just in time stuff in workshops to try um and had any success with that or like pre-surveys or things that strategies they like to try to get to know uh workshops participants ahead of time? I mean, the nice thing about if you're doing it via Zoom or you have some sort of like chat channel, you can play that game, particularly as people walk in, you know, in that like in between space. That, I mean, one of the hardest things is trying to say like, introduce yourselves but limit it to 30 seconds and then you have a person who ignores it totally. Make it meaningful though. Right. Limit it to 30 seconds, but it needs to be meaningful. Right. <laughs> and then you got the guy who does an hour and a half soliloquy about, you know, I don't know, everything that they've ever done. Um, so, I mean, like and cutting those people off is super hard, especially digitally. Um, <laughs> We're here in the Windows 98. Out. I got that was a fact. <laughs> I'm just Tom, you know, just seeing how you work under pressure. You're throwing variables at you. Because that's a big thing about workshops, too. I find that, I don't know about you all, but like I find like I prepare a workshop and I get to like one small piece of it. Like I always have this big vision for it. And if I get one small thing, that's it. And I think I always, the more I go into workshops, the more I pare down. It's just one idea take away, one thing. Um, and I have tend to, frankly, to your point, um, Shannon, I try to do more one-on-one -on -one or very targeted like group work where I know a class is going to be using it. And this is talking for a person who's not been in that context for a long time, so forgive me. But that's what I used to do at UMW is class of captivated 30 students, get a blog, sign up, here's how you post out. And then I'll revisit with, with stuff over the course of the semester. Um, but it was really like very like hit and run, hit and run. We captured you and most of their eyes would glaze, 
there are a few of them like, oh, I might need to know how to do this to post my history portfolio. But that was a very kind of focused thing. Um, I wasn't trying to um, get at any great concepts, you know, and I found that was a very successful way for me to do do it. Just very simple, very fast. Um, and then out. I do like the idea of have of trying to distill a workshop down to a single idea you want to communicate and kind of working backwards from there. Because I agree, I often also have this like grand vision that I can only describe in like three paragraphs. And it's like, no, that that's not a workshop. That's a class, maybe if you're lucky, like, you know, and then I end up throughout the process of making the workshop like doing things that say like literally i'll say the words well, like well if you're going to take away one thing and it's like nope if you're going to take away one thing that's the whole workshop probably <laughs> like yeah and, and, go backwards and, from there and it's funny because i i taught a lot of classes that were literature based right and like you ask people to read these 300 page books and then ultimately you talk about like five paragraphs right the whole of the whole book and it's like so those five paragraphs have to you know somehow bring everything together and make sense but be very consolidated and have a point and not that i ever did anything like that with my workshops my workshops were a mess tom can can attest to that but um i do think that idea of trying to just simplify a one or two very simple points you're trying to make about a bigger kind of way to use technology etc but a lot of times our ed tech tech uh, workshops, I wonder how people are running the AI ones now. I'd be interested, right? Because a lot of times blogging, it wasn't this big philosophical question. <laughs> it was like, yeah, you should write. You should get your stuff online. It's good to be online. It's good to be open. Like AI, it's like, <laughs> there will be blood. You will all die. The machine will suck your soul. Like it's a very different conversation, I imagine, when you walk into that room and super polarized. Anyone speak? That, that that may be the other thing that's hard about AI, at least when you're trying to do introductory stuff, is like distilling it down to like one aspect of it. It's really different, difficult because yeah. it's like talk about the internet. Well, which part? You know, so you're trying to cover a lot of different things and a lot of different concerns while functionally trying to at least what I try to do is talk through like how you build better prompts while also discussing philosophical, technological and the differences between various providers. You know, so when you say you overbuild uh, the last so I did this workshop not too long ago, I definitely like I had 7,000 examples. <laughs> you want to drop into Hugging Face and, you know, see a LLM that's been trained on 16th and 17th century manuscripts, talk to it about cows being cursed by witches. Like, I, that was an example I did. Um, well, you have to have a relatable example, you know? Yeah, that's right. I was like, what will people want to do with AI? Talk about cows and witchcraft. I work with a unique group. Uh, I work for a small graduate institute in Berkeley, California, and they're all um, older and overeducated. And so they just don't care <laughs> about learning anything. And um, I thought that we just got accredited for distance education. So it went from an alternative, personalized, you just talk to the teacher and write a paper kind of graduate institute to now they have to use technology to talk to people. And this is, you know, it's been four years now since they were forced to do that. And they just refuse to learn. So I'm, I'm down to now going to the faculty meetings and presenting five minutes on one Google Workspace app and then getting them to like, here's where your account is because they refuse to use their academic email. <laughs> I mean, it's just, uh, but so then when I tried to, tell them about AI, talk about not interested. Um, so I over prepare, my workshops are too long. And um, yeah, and all they care about is, you know, are the students cheating and is it gonna kill me? 
And because, um, you know, they listen to the news. I try to disabuse them of that, but that, that hasn't worked either. So I what I so my question ev everywhere in these informal things is what is it with academics? See, I, I'm a retired craftsman, so I was forced to learn. You learn or you get fired. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty simple. Um, you, and you learn the latest thing. I worked in uh, Santa Clara, California for 20 years. Don't call it Silicon Valley. Um, and so, you know, you keep up or you're out. Um, and then you go into academia and it's like, no, I've been, I've been uh, in denial for 20 years and I don't intend to change. So that I don't get. I don't think I have an answer for you, Mark, but I have also <laughs> observed that, that that's one of the biggest, like it, it's one of the hardest things to get through to academics is, and I, I sort of feel like it has to do with the insecurity that's behind that like um like what's the what's the thing that's holding you back from learning something new is that you might fail at it right like mm -hmm. and you're supposed to always be the smartest person in the room because you're the person with the the big degree right like um at least that has been my experience where it's like you know you're you but you know when people say like oh no i just prefer it this way it's better this way it's like well is it better for your students that way like you know like and that and that's another place where sometimes you can get a little bit well, of movement. I try that. You know, you know it's like, yeah. well, what about the children? <laughs> 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 and uh, that doesn't work either. Um, I think you, you know, just have to keep trying with the stuff, you know, like just keep trying it, like whatever comes into yeah. your head, like, you know, like just keep pushing into some, or ultimately understanding like what are, like, what can, how can it help them? Like if you can make that argument is like, it's almost like a sales pitch. Like, how can it yeah. help you like free up some time? How can it help you like not have to answer, you know, this many emails or whatever it is? I well, apparently, I don't know, these apparently not using their email, but mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I think maybe like maybe even one on one conversations might be a, another possibility. I, I've gone to that, thing. you know, um, and so I've I've for years I've accepted that, uh, you know, they need to be the smartest person. And, you know, I've, I've accepted that explanation. But now I'm down to, they're just lazy. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's it. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I've, I've reached out personally. And it's a very small, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, 10 faculty members or something. Um, and I've gone to that. And the current theme that I'm pounding on is uh, learning how to use the tools aligns with the mission. That seems to work with a couple of them. So, because it's a social justice kind of place, of course, Berkeley kind of social justice sure. kind of place. Yeah. Uh, but what about the children didn't work? And they're not children, obviously, but you know, um, yeah, it's, it's fun. I have to say. I feel like, I feel, I do feel like that strategy though, of just, of like, when you find something that is connecting, even if it's only connecting with one to two people or a few, like you got to do that because the minute you have some folks who, are then also working on this stuff, like like, um, you know, using the tools or whatever. That does snowball. Well, snowball is not the right word. It's much slower than that, <laughs> but you know, it does it does compound eventually. Very slow landslide. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and because because ultimately, like you know, like any other group of people, academics are a bunch of individual people who all have individual perspectives on something. I do think, Jen, what you said about like the perspective of like, I studied this thing and I'm good at this one very specific thing is a, does influence a lot because especially compared to, to, to like me where I like can't on a given day decide what my favorite, th I have too many little things that I'm only kind of good at, right? That's my whole thing. Um, but that's not most academics, you know, most academics know what it means to really understand a niche that I'm not even aware of right now. Right. So, um, that's very different. Um, but, um, yeah, I do think, I do think, you know, having that perspective in mind is important, but yeah, you ultimately got to give, you, you have to spend the time on the people who are interested. And at some points you're going to have to be like, all right, well, I've tried this, this, and this with this person and they're not responding. So like, okay, you know, I'll, I'll have to, I guess I have to continue on doing something else with someone else. I mean, sort yeah, of. Yeah, the existential crisis approach hasn't worked either. It's like, look, we're accredited now, 
And you have to use these tools. And if you don't, we'll lose our accreditation. That doesn't work either. <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't know. It's interesting. And they are older. You know, it's kind of a volunteer. It's a very small graduate institute. So they're way underpaid. It's, they're really volunteers with a stipend or whatever. So um, they're not really going to change. So. Well, I think that's a really important piece of information, though, right? Like if they're not, there's no incentive for them to change because, it, you know, what are what what's to be lost, right? You know, and I think that that's, that's the part that's really hard too. like where I am, you know, so I'm based in a New England institution and we can't keep hearing enough about how we have a shrinking pool of students and, you know, like it's just higher ed is really hard now. And it's like, okay, yeah, it, it is. But part of that is like, if you're not keeping up, then it's only going to get harder, you know, like, so that I think that's a, a piece that I tried to, you know, I guess get across as best I can is like, if, if we're like, we keep falling behind in like the technological elements and people just keep relying back on the, you know, I like to collect papers on actual paper, like, you know, kind of ideas. It's like, so how is that going to make our job any easier to recruit students here when you literally won't even share a syllabus electronically? Like, I mean, it's just, yeah. but I think it, it is part of that feeling of attack, right? Like, is that there's, people are questioning is, is, is college worth it? Is that, you know, like, and it, and it's like, you're kind of getting it from all sides. And so when somebody asks you to do one more thing, learn one other thing, it's like not, you know, a lot of times I feel like there's a lot of people who are really burned out on the whole thing, especially after COVID, especially if you were afraid of technology before COVID and, and then you got forced into it. And now you're just like, Nope, I just want to go back to my happy world before COVID, <laughs> you know? It, it sounds like it's, you know, part of it is establishing trust, too, that you're doing this for the same reasons that they do anything related to their job, you know, um, like, and it should be easy, right? In the sense that it's like, we all work here. We want this to be successful. That's I what think. I assumed, right? You know? It's like, we're all in this. And the thing <laughs> is, is the, you know, we don't make money. Okay. But we're volunteers. We're doing this voluntarily. And you have to use the tools. I, so I just assumed, I've been at this seven years now with this group. Um, and I just assumed they'd be like, great, somebody can show me how to do this stuff. Uh, but no, that didn't work out. Um, and also I have a class analysis. You know, it's like IT is like the pool boy or the trash man. You know, it's like IT, they come in at night, right? And they fix, they come in at night and fix things. I don't really have to see them. So um, but you can't raise that, that, you know, <laughs> well, and, and, and that's kind of what I mean with, with trust to, <laughs> or to a certain extent in that, like, um, I, I would always try and be really transparent about like when working with, with faculty, um, when I was, um, at, at my uh, previous job that I was doing this because I genuinely believe what I'm telling you today or whatever, is going to be better for students or better for you in these ways. And then you, ha I wanted to try and demonstrate why, right? Not beyond, beyond the, f me just saying, oh, we should do this because it's better and saying like, no, no, this is actually better for learning outcomes in these ways. But that's so hard to do for a lot of reasons. A, because, you know, some, some of it, like you can say we should be, you know, um, accepting papers via, a system instead of via pa pen and paper and and i would say and not because i hate pen and paper pen and paper is a fantastic reliable technology one of the best a real banger uh, in terms of of technology go you know is really great um but here's the other reasons not to do this or 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 that could be a benefit and it's so hard to frame that in a way that is helpful and doesn't feel like you're talking down to people um, it's uh, it really, really, really difficult. Um, and so I'd spend a lot of time trying to think about how I could do that and not, yeah, I don't know, just be simultaneously helpful, but also convey that I know what I'm talking about in this particular thing. Like I did think this through, I'm not selling you on whatever tool, literally, you know, like I'm, I'm doing this because I think it's better. 
Yeah, for instance, currently I'm, uh, so we finally formed a subcommittee or a committee to you know move this along after seven years um, with the chief academic officer uh, to get the faculty more involved somehow, maybe. Um, and so um, currently I'm explaining to everybody now more one-on-one -on -one, that currently the faculty for, uh, fill out a Word doc and email it to the chief academic officer and he reviews it, then he emails it to the uh, president, which shouldn't even be involved in this process, but it's such a small place. And then he reviews it and then he emails it to the administrative officer and then they upload it to the Google Drive. And I'm like, you know, if you just filled that out in the Google Drive, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, so talk about efficiency, you know, but I, I, this is my current one. I'm, you know, maybe I'll get some movement. Who knows? Anyway, I don't want to have this whole thing be about my faculty. <laughs> you need to get rid of them, Mark. I'm sorry. There's doesn't well, sound like you have any other option. And if you need help, Reclaim is, have, is a new service that we're coming out with. <laughs> Actually, I have friends in Oakland, California, so it's right <laughs> next to Berkeley. I can I can get it taken care of. Or as Reclaim. Kathy Davidson said at a, a digital pedagogy lab, uh, she was talking about that and somebody brought this issue up, comes up all the time, right? And she said, well, you know, it's just, you know, one casket at a time. And, uh, <laughs> oh which I thought was kind of astounding for her to say in public and it's recorded somewhere. But, exactly. <laughs> Let's reclaim the lame. Um, Sh Shannon and Tom are talking about sort of office hours and various workshop like things and kind of what the core of a workshop is. And yeah, I also find that really interesting because I don't know if anyone can necessarily describe what a workshop is really, um, because they can, I'm sorry, in like a one sentence, you know, um, that really gets to the point of it. That isn't sort of, oh, it's a meeting like this. It's like, well, that's not why we have them, <laughs> you know. That idea, I think like a lot of people are workshops are more hands-on than like a presentation. So that, that's one expectation, which isn't always met, uh, including with stuff I do sometimes, right? Um, yeah. And then like what we always struggled with is like I get into proof a lot because I have a lot of frustration with like doing stuff and feeling like it doesn't matter. And then also like paranoia about proving that stuff matters to other people um, because <laughs> that often has been the case in places where I've been. So, you know, I get into that too. Like I'm really, I always hated that phrase. Like if I just reach one child today, I'm like, then you did a terrible job because you had 300 <laughs> students today. You know, let's, let's get down to business. Oh, that means we're not doing this right. Um, we have to do a lot better than that. We need to be in the like, let's say 50% range. Um, and we'd still be awful. So, I mean, you know, like I think about that a lot with workshops. I can console myself and say it's on a super long tail. And I think that's true and it's good, but it also frustrates me on the other end where I'm saying like, why am I doing this if it's not an effective thing in general? Why don't I just have individual meetings with all these people? It would probably like do better we say like after five minutes, this isn't for me. And we cut out, you know, we save them a bunch of time. I, I don't know. Like those are the things I really struggle with with workshops. One of the reasons I like the drop in hours, they call them something fancy. They call them the Agora, like the open marketplace of ideas. And there were some cool things that happened because different people would be talking about different things and they kind of overhear. And sometimes that would lead to stuff. But again, happenstance, you know, lots of things that go against kind of those open office hours or drop-ins and lots of days, certainly towards the end where I sat there and did nothing um, while I did my regular work, which I guess I'll, I'll put in the nothing bucket. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So I don't know, like it's, it's part of it. And it's just so different. Like if you go in a classroom for students who have to use WordPress for this project, the way you interact with them and what you do is very different than trying to convince faculty that WordPress might be a way to to create open publishing or do blah, 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 like fundamentally different things. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, and I, that's I, always I, a one-on-one -on -one conversation. I think. I I, think I generally it's hard for it to be a workshop. I genuinely agree that those are different things, but I always tried to bring that in when I could, uh, like when, when I, cause that was a very common, yeah. Faculty would say, Hey, we want to do something with domain one zone or we want to make a WordPress blog or whatever. Um, can you come in and show my students how to do it? And I'd say, sure. And then I would try and get as much information about, you know, why, like, why, why are you doing this? What is, what's the role in the class? And then I would spend, and I would say typically, and I felt good about this. I don't know that every single faculty member and student who went to one of these maybe felt the same way I did, but at least I got some good feedback, which was like, I'd say, cool, I am going to go into that. We will spend like about 15 minutes getting them started on that, but I'm going to spend the other 15 minutes explaining to them why this matters <laughs> in, from my point of view, not from your, you know, I didn't obviously sell it this way but i spent much more time talking about like why are we creating in this case like a blog in this way and why does that matter or why do i think it matters essentially um and i don't know that i was always 100 percent successful but i my goal was to try and at least get some people hooked because that, again it kind of comes back to my thing of you know tools can be hard to use but a lot of things aren't really that hard if you're invested in them or or don't feel that hard if they're if you're invested in them and if the resources are there to find out more so if i could basically say let's get started here you go you are started now um and here's more information there's more information good luck you know it's wordpress there's actually a lot of information the 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 challenge is I've curated some of it for you um, <laughs> so that you don't have the entire internet to look at. Um, but before we do any of that, why are we doing it like this? Um, and yeah, because I think that's hard. I also felt like that was hard for faculty to argue to their own course. I could come in as a technologist and say, in my realm, this is why this is important. Faculty member has already described to you why you're doing it from the courses perspective and i would try to link the two together don't know i was always successful but that was my strategy <laughs> i've also tried to use that strategy taylor um and i guess i would say with mixed results <laughs> you know um it's it's how you mix it in i think um so what i tried to do is like have them do something and then talk about like a bigger idea right like you're setting your site visibility now these are your choices what happens if I pick this one? Can I, who can I share it with? You know, like, but also, hey, that means that this is live to the whole world, you know, like, um, which is, you know, for a lot of students is very intimidating. At least, I, you know, I work with undergraduates mostly and they're like, no thanks. Like, um, but then you can ask, you know, you can say, yeah, we're just starting. Like, but I think that another key piece for me is if I can work with students or if I can work with students at the beginning of their time at the university and then like offer, hey, you're going to, you can build on this, right? Like, this is how you might build on it. This, you might see it again here. You might see it again there. But it, that's the thing. It's, and it, it's a time investment. And I think that's the other struggle with technology. A lot of times, Mark, maybe to, to your situation too is like people are told they have to learn new things and then like a year later not now you don't now that's out and this other thing is in and now the next thing and now the next thing and it just they if they don't have that interest they just don't want it you know like and it just feels like oh it's another like whatever shiny new thing the administration thinks we need and then in two years it's going to be gone and uh, you know it doesn't mean anything to me anyway you know, so I think that that's the, the part that with students, it can be in some ways easier to make that connection because they're more comfortable usually with the idea of like, what what could this tool do? You know, because they just have used different ones compared to the, the faculty a lot of the time. Well, and you can use that strategy with students too, right? Because they can build on it over time, at least in some, some examples, right? Um, so, because that was always my main argument is that this doesn't have to die when you give up your when you give up your student email address you can take it with you if you want to or you can specifically not take it with you when you want to when you don't uh, if you don't want to so um that I, I resonated with some not all of course right but yeah i had hoped since they 
um, most of them had been in larger institutions, obviously, and had been through that, if I just wait this out, it'll go away thing. And that worked. But here, again, for seven years, I've just been trying to get them to use the Google workspace. That's it. And, you know, I keep showing them all the resources directly tied to it from Google, right? So one place to go, one thing to learn, well, one big thing to learn, one place to go. Um, but, you know, it's like you say, it's a long process. Um, Well, the crazy well, thing to me have, is, oh, oh, sorry, Jim. No, no, please. Well, you think about it, like, I guess we've been, I, I don't know, like, I know some of the people here, we've been doing this 25-ish years, maybe a little bit longer. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, like, if, if I, and I'm throwing away a lot of stuff right now, as I showed in the beginning when I threw away Time Magazine from 1991. Um, you know, like, I mean, I'm still having the same conversations with people about when to use a spreadsheet. Whatever we're doing is failing utterly at massive degrees of scale over 25 to 30 years. So you can take comfort in that anything you do will be just fine and probably- I feel better. much better. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, like, this isn't an isolated incident. This isn't an individual thing. This is massive catastrophic failure. <laughs> Are they all the same people? Have you been having the same conversation about spreadsheets with one person for 25 years, though, Tom? <laughs> no. But I can tell you that I have the spreadsheet conversation so often, it breaks my heart. You know, like fundamental building block things. Like, mm -hmm. this is the place you put numbers that you want to add. We don't mm -hmm. have a conceptual grasp of that. That's kind of broad spread. And this is, you know, me bouncing around a lots of different places, large public, now small private, small private someplace else, northeast, south, whatever, and internationally, you know, like I've messed with all this stuff. These are not isolated incidents. Yeah. Maybe restricted to my sphere of experience, but it's fairly broad, fairly long periods of time. I just wonder what would work and what what is our pace of change? You know, like that's always my thing is like, what is a reasonable expectation so that I don't feel like I'm wasting my time and then this is all stupid. And I don't like it being anecdotal, nice things with individual people who are just awesome. Because then I don't feel like my input or stuff that I did really was the change factor. I just happened to coincide with an awesome person. We were able to do some awesome stuff. But like that's not change at an ins institutional level. Yeah. It's tricky. Like I, um, I'm having a little bit of an existential crisis right now because I'm kind of like, maybe I don't believe in change at an institutional level in the sense that of course I, I do. Um, but like in the sense that like, I, I kind of feel like any kind of change like that is made up of a bunch of individual people changing something. Right. And I, I don't think that that happens all at once, or I don't know if it's, Maybe I'm just like naive, but I like I, I you know, I, I think I think that 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 we are going to have that spreadsheet conversation. And it, it is a bummer that we have to have it because uh, side thing. What if we educated people about this stuff? But what does we even mean in that thing I just said? Right. So I, it's complicated, obviously. But like, yeah, I don't know. Um, I. I I think it's it's hard to stack up those individual changes to make an institutional change. And I've not done it very often. So I definitely agree in that sense that it's very, very difficult to it um, can be. make I mean, those large changes. It can be depressing. Um, but I, at the same time, I have found in my experience that a lot of times there'll be faculty or students come to you and like, you know, I have a, a vision for like how I want this thing to change and experiment with what could help it change. You know, and there's no, I don't think my role as an ed tech did anything other than give them the possibilities to think through some tools and some possibilities to make that maybe work or go into the laboratory. And I always thought that's when the best work happened. And if you had a bunch of people doing it, your job was fun and people were like, wow, this worked out. And 
some of them like this sucked, but I actually see where I went wrong and what could happen. And then you kind of have a kind of virtuous cycle with a few people institutionally. No, I mean, as, as, as far as the magnitude of some of the work it amongst people in this call went institutionally, it was still marginal. And I think that's important to remember, but I think there are people who were able to kind of, you know, understand that this tools at their best were about augment, augmenting the relationship and ability to kind of do stuff synchronously and asynchronously and kind of share your thinking and develop a sense of person and place outside of class and build on that. I mean, I think all that stuff is still valuable. I think I like to work with the faculty and students who saw that, you know, or mm -hmm. who kind of grasped that always the idea of going in and I feel your pain mark to convince or let people see. It's like, ugh, like that was never, I mean, you know, as good a salesman as one could or couldn't be, it's a painful experience unless you're really one of those people who like to, to convert, you know, and then you really have that kind of, you know, um, religious kind of um, uh, halo around your work. And I, I think a lot of times it was just being with people who are smart and know that these tools can provide different ways at it. And then finding that relationship between those people and yourself to do it or a group to do it. And I think that's enough. I don't think it's institutional transformation. I think it's usually um, you transformed a faculty or two who transformed a learning experience for a group of people. And, you know, um, that was cool, right? Like, yeah. I think, you know, and I saw some of the effects and, you know, they didn't change the world, but they they helped us think through mm -hmm. a moment in, in higher ed where this stuff was happening. So, um, yeah. I, I you think can't know you it think didn't change broadly, the world, right? Yeah. We're in the world that we are. Broadly, though, <laughs> you kind of lose, you lose scope of what these things are good at. You know, and they're good at the kind of more focused um, specific. So, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. I, we're way off topic here. We've gone into like. <laughs> and I got to run. I really appreciate this yeah. chat. Um, and I, I dropped in that my my made up title for my volunteer position is technologian. So maybe <laughs> maybe I need to go to that. Um, I got to jump because I'm a facilitator at Story Center. So I got a, a digital story mapping class that I'm supposed to be in right now. So awesome. thanks for the chat. I hope to see you next time. Now that I finally found the calendar and sometimes I get the notices. Uh, <laughs> see you all. Thanks. All right. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Um, Shannon, I, I know you probably are close on time too, but I would love to hear if you have any time about the student-led stuff you're working on. Sure. Yeah. I'll give the quick plug in here. I'll link to like, so you can kind of see previous events, but I think we've discovered um, our way of not hating the idea of workshops, right? Because just notoriously always is that we, so everybody, most people here may be familiar with watching. We have digital knowledge center peers helping other peers with digital projects. And so the main goal of actually our our workshops are they're student proposed. Sometimes there are consultants, but a lot of times they're just students who have like are interested in something. Say like the president of the photography club wants to run a workshop on something. The fun part of that is for at least Cartland and I is that they propose they want to do something. We meet with them to talk about, okay, how do you make an effective workshop? Let's let's work together to figure out what are the beats of this workshop that, you know, because everything you all been talking about, like what, it, like how do you hone in on that? Like one idea, because um, most students do not know what is useful workshop. Um, and then we have them, we do a whole rehearsal. So we do it, we treat it live, like we do a live run through so that they can kind of, we can see it and give them feedback like on how that goes. And then they do it. And we found like, this is rewarding for us in the sense like it kind of, it maybe it's not like always quote unquote useful things like you know we have one on rotoscoping like how many people actually need to know about that it's not a lot but for us the student that student the presenter getting useful like experience in doing something like that is the main goal the attendees may get something out of it but for us like we're like by flipping the notion of like what the workshops are for 
we have found that to be a more meaningful experience. And then we get like lots of interesting things. And then it seems oh, we do a lot of, I'll also say a lot of work to market those things. You can kind of see the fun graphics. We do like all that work so the students don't have to, but students also seem to show up for other students stuff <laughs> um, more than like when I'd like, be like, it's me doing it. It's like, okay, whatever. Um, uh, they seem to be able to recruit uh, that kind of support too. So it's like, it's a, it's a lot of fun and it's like, Right, it's, we're kind of get. We can then kind of open it up to anything. Like we don't have to know about the thing. The student just needs to know about it. We just have to be the people that can help them think about how to distill what they're trying to do. And then, like you can see on the website, they could link to that into the future. It has their name here. I did this workshop, you know, um, and we hope to set them up for success. So actually, understand what makes a useful workshop. Um, you know, uh, you know, in that period of time. So it's a lot of fun. We uh, at first I was hesitant, and now it's like no, this is. I, it gets us out of doing it, but in a more interesting position um, to kind of facilitate kind of cool work. So, well, yeah, that's amazing. And like you obviously get to it, it serves so many like aligned purposes. It's, it seems like to me, right, Like because you get to also say, like, this is the DKC offering this. And so that is a benefit because you get to showcase sort of the breadth of things that you're uh, the, that your students know and, and can help with, which is obviously inherently valuable. The students get this amazing experience. They get to work with you and Cartlin on, on building a yeah. good workshop, which is something they'll use for the rest of their lives. Um, <laughs> like it, it's a, kind of a win, 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 as many W's as you want there. It's really cool. Yeah. My, man, honestly, my favorite part of this, so we do like when we figure out the presentation, we, we call it a jam. And we yeah. do, part of the jam is that we then figure out the title of the workshop, which is often the most fun part. If anybody came to the Cartman and I presentation on the summer, it's like we get in front of a whiteboard and then we just kind of like throw things at the wall. Like if you can kind of go through, you know, the previous events, like that is like, it's interesting because it's also an exercise in distilling. Do we all agree what this workshop is about? Because if you can title it <laughs> well, like yeah. we all know what this, this is going to be. Um, about and it just makes it, uh, I think, fun too. Like trying to come up with something like ridiculous. Um, uh, like my, I think my my uh, I kind of find that one, but like one of my favorite ones was like, "Oops, I made the web accessible," and it was like a one about like web accessibility. It's just like the fun you can sometimes throw out something that sounds stupid, and somebody's like, "Actually, I think that might work as a title," and then just work as a marketing thing. You know, students will stop and like look at something that is interestingly titled rather than. Uh, Domain of one's own workshop. It's like, eh, you know, it's like, but something like, <laughs> you know, uh, br you know, smooth moves using like, you know, just fun <laughs> kind of things to get a student's look. It's a little bit of like, sometimes I feel like I'm making clickbait, but it's at least kind of entertaining. <laughs> it worked for the internet. Clickbait. I know. Right? I mean, yeah, you're just using it for the power of good. Not for exactly. advertising revenue, so it's fine. Jeez. This is awesome. Um, I think uh, we're we're well over time, um, but uh, thanks, Shannon. Also, specifically, I know now we're almost ten minutes over, but I, <laughs> this is great. Um, and uh, so I'm going to hit the stop on the recording here.